year, our theme this year as a church is 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. And I'm thankful for that verse, I'm thankful for that, <clears throat> that theme, and we've got to be, uh, we're laborers together with God, we've got to be with Him first, or we won't labor with each other unless we're with him first. And I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you for coming. And we won't be long in here, but I did want to have a, have a good time of singing, fellowship, and preaching. Thank the Lord for Brother Watson coming tonight. And Brother Roy, won't you come up and lead us in a song? Can you do that? That'd be all right? Can you do that right quick? Okay, great. Brother Roy's going to come up and lead us in a song. We don't have a piano player, do we? This, Brother Jimmy's here. Can you lead it a cappoco? Can you do that? A cappella, is that right? <laughs> I do that on difference. All right, fellas. Let's see if you're awake. Brother Roy is going to lead us in a song, but I do appreciate you coming and to thank the Lord for being here. This is, a, I think this is the fourth year, I believe. Uh, it's third or fourth, gentlemen? That is. Third, third or fourth, third year <clears throat> that we've had this. And uh, last year, I want to mention this before Brother Roy comes. We had a gentleman here, <clears throat> many of you fellas know, Brandon Bowles, call him BB. And uh, he went out into eternity this past year, not long ago. I want to pray for his family. But you know what it reminds me of is just how brief life is. I mean, I remember seeing B.B. here last year at the at, out in Fellowship Hall at the meeting. And just, you know, having a good time, fellowship. And I guess he went hunting. I don't, did he go hunting with y'all, Danny, last year? And uh, had a good time together. Who'd ever thought a year later he'd be missing? You know, none of us know for sure. We're going to be here the next five minutes, let alone tomorrow. But we must give an account for where we are today. Amen. I'm glad you're here. Man, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Brother Roy's going to lead us in a song. What we got, Brother Roy? Number three, Amazing Grace. Number three, Amazing Grace. You know it. And uh, gentlemen, let's stand together and sing with me. Can you? And Brother Roy's going to lead us. Everybody should know this. This is the old Baptist hymnal. All right, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found. Was blind, but now I see. Was great that taught my heart to and great my fear really how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Oh, when we've been there ten thousand years, our bright shining as the sun, we've no last day to see God's grace. Then when we first begun, Thank you, man. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you again for being here. Let's bow for a word of prayer. And I'll ask these gentlemen here to sing for us. And Miss Megan's going to play for them. And Brother Watson's got some guys from his church going to come up and sing for us. And we're excited about it. Boys, I can't wait to hear you. And looking forward to it. Of course, looking forward to hearing Brother Watson preach. And let's pray together and ask God's blessing on the remainder of the service. Father, we thank you. For your goodness, your mercy, Lord, thank you for salvation. God, I thank you for saving Brother Roy's brother yesterday, Dallas. God, we rejoice in it, and I know there's rejoicing in heaven. There's a new name written down in glory. I'm thankful for that. God, I pray that you'll bless here tonight. Lord, there may be someone here tonight that don't know for sure. Lord, if they stepped out into eternity, that they'd be with you. And I pray before the night's over, they'll make that sure. And God, I'm glad you gave us your word. We don't have to wonder 
how we can get to heaven. We can know without a shadow of a doubt based on your eternal word. Thank you for that. Thank you for these men that are here and all the hours of labor that's represented here. And I pray you'll give safety to the men to be uh, hunting labor later on tonight. And as we go to our respective places, bless, I pray. Bless Brother Watson as he preaches in just a moment. Bless the singing. May it all be done to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' precious, sweet, holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. What has happened to a nation who used to fear the Lord? To a people whose foundation was built upon God's word. We've allowed the world's opinion to chart a different way. But it's time the church of Jesus Christ should boldly stand and say, God's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans. God's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of man. God's word will stand. They can take it from the courthouse walls, remove it from the schools, teach our children that we're animals, speak against the golden rule, try and hide our Christian heritage apart from the public eye, but they'll never overcome God's word, no matter how they try. God's word will stand against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans god's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of man god's word will stand Against the raging tide of those who criticize and work their evil plans, God's word will stand against the gates of hell with power to prevail in the hearts of man. God's word will stand. God's word. Amen. Thank you, fellas. Wasn't that a blessing? I'm glad his word will stand. Amen. Doesn't matter what happens in the White House. God's word is firm. It's sure. It's settled in heaven and it's not moving. I'm glad we have an anchor for our souls in shifting times. Boy, we live in a day. Uh, this stuff in France we just seen, uh, it's going to happen more and more and more, but I'm glad we have a sure foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Brother Watson, good to have you tonight. To have the fellows come on up and sing, and as soon as they get done, you just preach to us, my brother, and we're glad you're here, all the way from South Carolina, and Brother Ronnie Venable had a part, a huge part, in uh, building Brother Watson's new church building, and these folks have been such a blessing to us, and I'm so thankful for it. And I heard these guys in October at uh, Crafts for Christ Banquet, and I asked them to come sing for us, and so they're going to do that tonight. You pray for them. I know they'll be a blessing to you.
your song will be singing is I Want to Be That Man. And it's about a boy looking up to his daddy at a young age and wanting to be the man that his daddy is. And I want to thank the Lord for my daddy. I want to thank the Lord for a godly parent. I want you to hear them sing, and then we'll get your song. Are you singing too? Or just you want us to? <laughs> Great! 
y'all got one more? All right, you do one more. Ain't that good? That's a blessing, I tell you. The devil don't have them all. Thank God for that. You pray for these young men. Thank you, Brother Watson. You come ahead and preach to us. Thank you for bringing these young men with you. And boy, they've been a blessing, and I appreciate that. And boy, if we've ever needed a daddy, it's to be what God would have you be. It's now. If we ever need a man to be the husbands and the men of God that we need them to be. It's now. And I'm thankful for this pastor and thankful for his friendship. And he's going to preach to us tonight. You listen to him gladly. Again, I thank you for being here. And I know he'll be a blessing to you. And you receive it. Receive it gladly. And I know it'll be from the Word of God. And Brother Watson, thank you so much for being here. Thank Brother, you, God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Well, it's a blessing to be here tonight, ain't it? Thank God. Thank God. I love it. I appreciate all the men here tonight, all the good cooking. And uh, this is the first Wild Game Fellowship I've had the privilege to go to. Me and my little boy hunt all the time. And uh, he was one of the guys in the group playing the piano, and I sure am proud of those little fellows. I'm telling you, they are a blessing, and I sure am thankful. Like the preacher said, the devil hadn't got them all. I found out this a long time ago, preacher. Most parents hit what they aim at, and uh, if we don't aim at anything, we'll hit it every time. And may the Lord help us to point them like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. I sure am thankful. I appreciate all you young fellows sitting up on the front row, and boy, the teenagers that sang earlier, that was a blessing to my heart. And it's, it's just good to be here with you men tonight. Thank God on a Saturday night, 
Wasn't all that long ago, about 20 years ago, I promise you that church would have been the last place I'd have been on a Saturday night. But I'm sure am glad to be here tonight with you fellas. And uh, I don't know anything about most of you. I sure am glad the Lord crossed our paths with Brother Joe Pigram and Brother Ronnie Venable. And through them crossed our path with Preacher White. And, and we've been able to come up a couple of times to the banquet and just get, a, to get the fellowship with some of the good folks here at Freedom Baptist. And uh, man, I, I know the ladies are not in here, but my hat's off to all the hard work that went on behind the scenes, cleaning and preparing. And, and I appreciate all you men that prepared the food. I have been blessed by being here already tonight. And I thank you so much uh, for being with us tonight. For the invitation, preacher, thank you for letting us come. It's been an honor and a, a privilege to be a part of this meeting tonight. If you have your Bibles with, me, with you tonight, if you'll look with me in the book of 1 Samuel tonight, 1 Samuel chapter number 30. I want to just give you a thought tonight, and I want to challenge the men since it's just us tonight, and I don't know anything about most of you. You don't know anything about me. I'm just an old country boy from Patrick, South Carolina. Got saved when I was 23 years old, and God called me to preach, and I thank God for the great privilege of serving Him. And I didn't, wasn't raised in a Christian home, didn't know anything about God, just living the party life. God saved me, and about a week and a half later, saved my wife. And uh, man, we've been serving the Lord ever since. And uh, I was just busy before then. I was a bull rider riding the rodeo circuit hard and heavy. And, and uh, God saved me by His grace. And uh, I don't know what's more, most more difficult, riding bulls or pasturing, but I'm sure getting the hang of it a little bit along the way. <laughs> Amen, I hope. Uh, I'm wondering if it might be easier riding bulls sometimes. But it sure is good to be in the house of the Lord on Saturday night. First Samuel chapter number 30 tonight. If you don't mind, would you stand with us as we reverence the Word of God? I like to do that since we stand and reverence the American flag. Certainly we ought to reverence God's Word tonight. First Samuel chapter number 30. I want you to notice in your Bible, the Bible says in verse number 1, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. Excuse me, the Bible says in verse number two, and had taken the women captives that were therein and slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, uh, and uh, Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, and every man for his sons and for his daughters. And by the way, when it comes to your family, men, you'll do things you wouldn't normally do. And that's where these men were. Their wives' lives and their children's lives were in jeopardy. And now they're beginning to turn their weapon on their leader, David. But David, the Bible says in verse number six, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And, and Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. If you go on to read the rest of the chapter, you'll find out that David did exactly that. He took about 600 men and they begin to make their way. They come to Ziglag and of course they find out it's been burned with fire. Their wives and their children have been taken captive. He asked the Lord, shall we pursue? And God tells him to go after them, go get them back. And so they're going to get their wives and their children back and they come to a brook called Bezor. There was 200 men that were so faint, the Bible says they couldn't cross over and pursue they sat down by the brook to cool their feet in the water. The other 400 men, including David's mighty men, went with him and they went and the Bible says they recovered all. They brought back everything that the Amalekites had taken and it's including their wives and their children. But I'd like to call your attention tonight to just a verse or two. The Bible says in verse number four, and David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept 
until they had no more power to weep. Verse number six says, and David was greatly distressed. I mean, they have cried until there's no more tears in their tear ducts. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his own sons and for his daughters. But notice what the Bible says at the end of verse six. In the middle of David being distressed and even his own army turning their weapons on him, threatening to stone him, the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That word encouraged himself, that expression encouraged himself is a very interesting word. If you look it up in a Bible dictionary, it has a lot of definitions, but it means to be strong. It means to bind. It means to restrain or to conquer. It means to continue, to be of good courage. It means to be mighty, to make strong, to be stout. It also says, according to Strong's Concordance, it says it means to play the man. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says when David was distressed, the Bible says even though his circumstances had not changed, the Bible says that David was made strong. He became strong and he played the man. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, in other words, gentlemen I want you to notice that when everything was going wrong in David's life, he did not just lay down and quit on God. The Bible says that he manned up. He played the man. If the Lord help me, I don't preach this for a few minutes on this subject. Mandates to man up. Mandates to man up. Father, thank you for the privilege to be in this place tonight. And I thank you for these men. Thank you for their families. Lord, no doubt there's many men here tonight that have sought the Lord with all of their heart, as these young fellows sang about earlier. God, there may be some among us tonight that may not even know you tonight. But I pray that wherever we are and wherever we're from tonight, that as we assemble in this place, that the God of this universe would speak to every heart. And I pray that you'd draw us all closer to Jesus Christ as a result of hearing thy word, we pray, and we ask it in his lovely name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Now here in our text in 1 Samuel chapter number 30, the Bible tells us that King David had made an alliance with Achish. And Achish, no doubt, was not even a saved man. And David had tried to make an alliance with the world to defend himself against Saul. And of course, I'm not gonna get into all the background of it, but the Bible says that they came back to Ziglag. This was a little place, a little, a little place to live that Achish had given David and his men. And the Bible says after they came back from battle that they found as they topped the hill, that they topped the hillside, they noticed at a distance there was smoke back at the camp. And as they approached back to their home camp, they noticed that it was their tents that were on fire. It was their homes that were on fire. And the whole place was aflame and blazing. The Bible says that while they were away in battle, they were fighting against the Philistines and fighting against the world and all the previous chapters leading up to this and and no doubt fighting against Saul's men. And and here they are, they're weary worn and they're battle worn and they're coming back home thinking that they're gonna get some rest and recovery only to find that the the Amalekites had come in and had burned their own homes and the Amalekites had taken their wives and their children captive and the Bible says they were all led away by the Amalekites. Now when you read that, that may 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 not mean a whole lot to you tonight unless you understand who the Amalekites were. The Bible teaches us that the Amalekites were descendants of a man by the name of Amalek. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Esau was the twin of a man named Jacob. Jacob is a type of the spirit in the Bible. Esau is a type of the flesh. The Amalekites, the grandson of Esau, Amalek, is, ladies and gentlemen, a type of the flesh in the Bible. Now, those of you that understand that, those of you that are saved, you know that when we get saved, that we have a spirit man trying to live for God, but we have an enemy live within ourselves called the flesh that battles that that battle that went on in the womb of Esau and Jacob's mother still going on in us today between the flesh and the spirit. Jacob and Esau rest 
wrestling with each other. The spirit man wants to live for God, but the flesh wants to fight us every step of the way. I don't know of anything destroying more homes and more families than Amalek today. I don't know of anything leading more children and young people away captive than Amalek in our day, especially even in our Bible-believing churches. There's men that want to live for God. I'm convinced tonight there's some of you men sitting here tonight. You want to live for God? You want to go forth for God? You want to lead your wife for God? You want to lead your kids for God? You want to lead your family for God? But every step of the way, there's going to be a battle with that old man named Amalek. And here in the Bible, we find that the Amalekites had came in and they had burned their homes down with fire. David and his men topped the hillside and they see their tents on fire. And no doubt their hearts sank in their chest when they realized that their wives were gone and their children were gone and the flesh had came in and taken everything that they had from their homes. Now, I want you to notice a few things about the flesh that every man here tonight needs to understand. First of all, I want you to notice the attack of the flesh. David, the Bible says in verse number one, and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. David had just defeated the Amalekites back in chapter number 27. But now when you get to chapter number 30, the Amalekites had conquered his family and led his family, led their families away captive. Brother, just because you get victory over the flesh, just because you had it yesterday, doesn't mean you'll have victory over the flesh today. Let me tell you something, your flesh is like your beard. The only way to keep it shaving back is to shave it every day. Brother, you can kill the flesh, you can conquer the flesh, and it'll be right back tomorrow. Brother, it's a daily battle against the old man, against our depraved nature. There's a man inside of you trying to live right, but flesh will fight you every day of your life from being what God wants you to be. The flesh is never neutral. Notice Amalek didn't stand by in neutral gear. The flesh attacks. Listen to me. The only way to deal with Amalek is to attack Amalek. You don't wait for the flesh to attack you, sir. You don't wait for the flesh to come against your family, sir. You've got to aggressively go after the flesh. You've got to attack the flesh. Amen. You must not leave Amalek alone and hope that he leaves you alone. He is not neutral. He comes after you with everything he's got. And so we see the attack of the flesh. Then we see the aggression of the flesh. Watch this now. In verse number two, the Bible says that they took the women and the children in bondage. They took the women and the children captive. They led their families away captive. By the way, the reason that the women and the children were helpless before the Amalekites is because there was no men in Ziglag to protect them from being taken captive. Sir, let me tell you something. Let me tell you what the Bible says. God expects you to be the spiritual protector and provider for your home. When there's an absence of the spiritual man in the home, it leaves our wives vulnerable spiritually. Listen, I know there's some single women out there doing the best they can, but sir, if you're married, God expects you to be the spiritual leader of your house. Let me tell you why a lot of women and children are being taken captive today. It's because daddy is absent. Daddy has made an alliance with King Achish. Daddy's made an alliance with the world. And brother, the flesh takes people hostage. Listen to Emma is not satisfied until he takes your family, until he takes my family, until he destroys your marriage, until he destroys my marriage. Amalek is on the attack. I preached a message one time out of Matthew chapter 12. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, and how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? Do you know what Jesus said? He said, how can anybody, how can a thief come in to a man's house and take everything he's got unless he first, preacher, bind the strong man of that house. What he's saying is that that man 
cannot touch what's in that man's house until he first bind the protector and amen, the strong man of thy house. Do you know daddy God has put you in your house to be the strong man in your home to protect your wife, protect your children, protect your family spiritually and the devil cannot take what you've got if there's a strong man in the house that's strong in the scriptures, that's strong in the spirit, that's strong in supplication. God give us a generation of men that's more interested in being strong in God than they are strong in this world. Men, if there's ever been a day, this world is starving to death for some genuine, masculine, born again, God loving, God fearing men. We need some today, amen. That's right. Thank God for all these young kids serving God. Thank God for you young men. I'm going to tell you fellas something. Y'all are a blessing to me tonight. I appreciate some young fellas with a fire burning their bones for God in a day when most teenagers are sitting downtown on the tailgates of pickup trucks. Amen, throwing their white life away. I'm glad there's some young men with a fire burning for God in their bones that want to make a difference for Jesus Christ. That's the kind of men that a woman wants to be married to. That's the kind of man that children want to look up to. They want a daddy that loves God who will say this is the word of God. This is the son of God. This is the will of God. Let's do the will of God for our family. God, give us a generation of leaders, spiritual, strong men. We see the attack of the flesh. We see the aggression of the flesh. We see the aftermath of the flesh. In verse number three and verse number four, the Bible says when they came home and found out the Amalekites had come in and burned everything down, spoiled their goods, took their wives and their children, the Bible says that they began to weep. Verse number six tells us that they wept until they couldn't weep anymore. I mean, brother, they had wept every tear they had. They were so distressed. There was no more tears to cry in verse number four. And in verse number six, the Bible says David was greatly distressed because everybody is threatening to stone him. I mean, brother, this crowd has been conquered by the flesh. I want you to notice something, men. Every, listen to me, there's something about every one of these Characters in this story, they're all men. And they all had their homes attacked by the flesh. I'm gonna tell you something, brother. Listen to me. Men, your home and my home is in the crosshairs of the adversary. And I want you to understand that God Almighty has put you at the doorpost of your home to be the strong man of that house to protect your family from Amalek. Sir, you do have a right to tell your kids what's permitted in your home and what's not permitted in your home. Sir, you not only have a right, but you have a God-given responsibility to tell your teenagers what they can have in their bedrooms, what kind of music they can listen to, what they can look at on TV, what they can't, where they can go, where they can't go, who they can hang out with. Amen, that's right. Me and it's not mama's responsibility. Don't say go ask your mama. It's our responsibility as daddies to mark our territory and tell them a leg, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord and leave my family alone, amen. That's right. Amen. The devil will never show you what Amalek wants to do to your home. When you're out there with the Philistines and warming up with King Achish, I want you to know something. The devil will never show you what it's doing to your family and doing to your kids. You can go out and enjoy the world, sir. You can go out and live in sin if you want to. You can go out and drink all the beer you want to, smoke all the dope you want to, pop all the pills you want to. Listen to me, the devil don't care. Help yourself, but I want you to know while you're out there flirting around with the world, those Amalekites are surrounding your tent, sharpening their swords. They're looking at your wife. They're looking at your kids and there's not a strong man at home to protect them from the adversary of our souls. And so I want you to notice something here very quickly and I'm being very conscientious of the time. I'm gonna be done in just a second. I want you to notice what do you do when the flesh is attacking your home? Sir, what do you do when the flesh is reaping havoc in your home? i tell you, the brother, listen, there's a lot of good tools that technology has given us. But when tools become toys, we get in trouble. 
There's nothing wrong with the internet. Thank God it's been a healthy and a good tool. But it's like a chainsaw. A chainsaw is a good tool, but I'm not going to give my chainsaw to my little eight-year-old boy and let him play with it like a toy. And I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me, men. God expects you to protect your family, to protect your children from tools becoming toys. When tools become toys, sir, it will attack your marriage. When tools become toys, and brother, listen to me, I know it's become the silent subject, but internet pornography has, becoming one of the, has become one of the most deadly, detrimental devices of Satan and the flesh to destroy families and marriages across this country. Brother, we'd be shocked if we knew sitting here tonight what men sitting in this building tonight have been looking at this week. We'd, I'm telling you something, brother, listen to me. We'd be shocked if we could put on a big screen what's went through the minds of the men sitting in this building tonight. Now I want you to know something, sir. Amalek's out to get you. He wants your marriage. He wants your home. He wants that boy of yours. He wants that little girl of yours. And God expects you to realize that Amalek has no power over a man who's walking in the spirit and you can overcome the flesh and protect your family. I want you to notice something. Here's what David did. Here's how you do it. When the flesh is attacking your home, the first thing David did, the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David didn't go out and get drunk. I mean, when everything started going haywire, everything was going wrong, David didn't come home and start grabbing his hair and say, what do I do now? He didn't go out get doped up on pain medication and they hope that everything would just go go away come sun, sun, come morning. But brother, listen to me, he didn't run from his responsibilities. He didn't run from his duties. You know what he did? The Bible says he played the man. The Bible says David manned up. He realized that if anybody was gonna get his family back, he was gonna have to get his family back. If anybody was gonna conquer the Amalekites, he was gonna have to conquer the Amalekites. And by the way, notice the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. He didn't have the preacher to come by and encourage him. He didn't have a brother to come by and encourage him. He didn't have anybody to come by and encourage him. Matter of fact, all his buddies were now threatening to stone him. Brother, he had nobody to encourage him. And there's some folks that'll just roll over and play dead if they don't have somebody to keep them motivated and keep them going. Listen to me, I'm not, listen, I'm not promoting anybody. I'm not a big fan of John Maxwell or anything like that, but he said a quote, and I want to give you a quote. This is what he said. He's got a lot of information on leadership. He said this whole idea of motivation Motivation is a trap. He said, forget motivation, just do it. Do it without motivation. Sir, listen to me. If we're going to protect our families from sin, from absolutely being destroyed by sin, there's going to be times when you have no motivation. There's going to be times when nobody's there to encourage you. There's going to be times when there's nobody there to pump you up and keep you prodded up, primed up, and pumped up to do right. There's just going to be times when everything in your flesh wants to give in and lay down. You're going to have to play the man. Sir, it's time to man up and protect your family from sin. Amen. He encouraged himself. So number two, he inquired of the Lord. Verse number eight, the Bible says he began to ask the Lord whether or not, what he ought to do. When David felt overwhelmed, he didn't just figure out his own way to try to deal with it. Gentlemen, listen to me. Listen to me. Tonight, some of you may be sitting here and it seems like your whole world, you, listen to me, you know that there's men around you that have no idea what you're going through. They don't know the mess your marriage is in. They don't know the mess your home is in. They don't know the mess your mind is in, the mess your life is in, and you're thinking about just giving up and quitting and just throwing in the towel and quit going to church and quit reading your Bible and quit praying. But I want you to know something, gentlemen. Listen to me. He didn't just do his own thing. He went to the Word of God in prayer and said, God, what would you have me do in this situation? He inquired of the Lord. While Saul was inquiring of a witch a few chapters back, David now is inquiring of the Lord. Where do you turn when everything's going wrong in your life? Amen. You're not going to find help reading your daily horoscope. 
You're not going to find help going down to the palm reader. The only place you're going to find help is in the Lord our God. He inquired of the Lord. Then, thank God, thirdly, he engaged in the conflict. He didn't just lay down and wallow in his pity. He didn't roll over and play dead and wait for the preacher to come, go get his family back for him. No, sir. David said, I've got a responsibility as the man of my house to man up, and he encouraged himself and played the man. His heart was crushed with pain, but yet he he pursued the enemy in spite of the pain. You say, why, preacher? Why is that so important? Maybe you're here tonight and you really don't care what the flesh is doing to your family. Maybe you're not even interested, sir, in what the flesh wants to do to your life and what it's doing to your mind. The Bible says this. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Do you know that God Almighty wants you to have life and peace, sir? And you will never have life and peace without having victory up here. And I'm gonna tell you, listen to me. When I talk about the flesh tonight, there's some reasons why you need to get victory over the flesh. There's some reasons your family, listen to me, sir, your wife needs you to walk in victory for God. If you're not saved, sir, your wife, your children need you to get saved by the grace of God so you can lead them spiritually. If you don't know the Lord personally, you can't lead them spiritually. That's the first step of manning up. It's time that men man up. I'm going to tell you something, brother. A man's not determined. We go out and knock doors every week. We've got a church full of folks. Go out and tell folks about Jesus. And these big old guys come to the door. You know, they got a beer in their hand. And, and then, brother, they, they, talk, they come with their muscle shirt on. And they're all pumped up talking about how much they can bench press. I'm going to tell you something, sir. That's not a man. A man's not determined by how much he's bench pressing. I'm going to tell you something. Most of those men talk about how tough they are. They wouldn't pick up a Bible and go tell someone about Jesus if their life depended on it. Amen. Real men will pick up a Bible instead of a dumbbell and say, by the grace of God, I want to lead my family into something that's going to matter for all eternity. Amen. And so I want you to notice the reason why it's so important. I'm closing with this. Here's why it's so important, sir, that you man up. You need to man up because there's a field that must be reached. If you go on to read verse number 10 through verse number 13, the Bible says they start going out and they're looking for these Amalekites. They're running out, preacher, and David and his men cross the brook Bezor and they're, they're looking for this man. Notice what the Bible says they did. The Bible says in verse number, um, verse number 10, I believe it is, Look in verse number 10, the Bible says, but David pursued he and 400 men for 200 a boat behind, which were so faint they could, they could not go over the brook Bezor, and they found, look at this, an Egyptian in the field. Egypt in the Bible is a type of the world. It's a type of those that are lost. We were all in Egypt at one time in bondage to Pharaoh. Here's an Egyptian in the field, and they brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and clusters, uh, clusters of raisins. And when he had, heated, he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. They go out. Watch this now. They go out. They find this Egyptian in the field. And the Bible says, Brother Craig, that when they found this Egyptian in the field, that he was starving to death. He hadn't eaten anything. And the Bible says they gave him bread to eat. They gave him water to drink. They gave him figs and they gave him food to eat. And the Bible says he had been three days and three nights without one single drop of water. Here's why. Look in verse number 11. The Bible says in verse number 11, they found an Egyptian in the field. And the Bible says they gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water. I want you to notice something, ladies and gentlemen. Notice this Egyptian. The Bible says he was out in the field and he was starving to death and he went on to tell them later on in the story. He said in verse number 13, David starts asking him some questions. And David asked him in verse number 13, David said unto him, to whom belongest thou? Where'd you come from, young man? Notice what he said. He said, and whence art thou? He said, I'm a young man of Egypt. Servant to an Amalekite. You know why this man was starving to death out in this field? Because he was a slave to the flesh. You know why men are starving to death spiritually tonight while this preacher is standing up here preaching? Because, ladies and gentlemen, men are servants to the flesh. 
And here, we all at one time when we were lost in Egypt were servants to the flesh. We did whatever Amalek told us to. And notice what he said, my master, master left me because three days ago on I fell sick. Let me tell you something about the flesh, the world, the devil. They'll leave you to die in the field as well. They may claim to be your buddies and your friends today, young man, but let me tell you something. When the world has squeezed all they want out of you, they'll leave you in the field starving to death. You won't have bread to eat, water to drink, and you'll be there to die. Ladies and gentlemen, the field here's a type of the world. There's sinners all around us that need somebody to go after them lest they die in the field. Think of where that young man would have found himself, Brother Gary, had David and his men stayed home. Brother Venable, think about where that Egyptian would have found himself. He'd have still been a slave to an Amalekite. He'd have starved to death at the hands of the Amalekites, left for dead in the wilderness in the field to die. Brother, there's people all around us that need somebody to go out and man up and take the gospel to a lost and dying world around us. Men, let me tell you something. Listen to me. If we're not going to reach them, who is? You know, listen to me. Thank God for all the good food tonight. It was wonderful. But I'm going to tell you something. God sits in heaven tonight, and he's a lot more interested in what you're eating right now than he was what we were eating over there a few minutes ago. He's a lot more interested in feeding you spiritually. You know why? Because he sees you in a field starving to death. Why, you wouldn't admit it, but in your heart you know that you're starving to death for something this world has not given you. You've tried everything the world had to offer and you're still not satisfied. You tried to find it in everything that the Amalekites had to offer, but yet every time you feed your flesh, you walk away feeling guilty, saying there's gotta be more than this. Every morning you wake up after your episode with the flesh the night before, you wake up the next morning and you know in your heart there's gotta be something more than this and you're left empty day after day and week after week and you know there's a God in heaven who can feed you something this world knows nothing about. His name is King Jesus. He wants to feed you tonight. Something I'm like will never feed you. Thank God, preacher. I appreciate what you had tonight. I appreciate it, brother. I enjoyed it. I've never been to a wild game fellowship. I thoroughly enjoyed myself over here, but I'm really enjoying myself over here. Man, I, listen, if, if, if your preacher was preaching, I'd been enjoying it even more. I mean, brother, thank God for giving us life. You don't know where this old boy came from. I remember what it was like, sir. Listen to me, I wasn't raised in this. I didn't know anything of this like this existed. I was a little boy, I went to church two or three times to a little dead church that never talked about getting saved, never talked about salvation. I was raised as a young boy, running out with a fake ID, buying alcohol as a teenager, getting drunk as a teenager, wrecking and ruining my life. I remember sitting in a jail cell one night, being locked up for DUI, and there was drunk sitting all around me and brother we sat there I got to think of, there's got to be more to life than this I didn't listen to him I never heard a preacher preach I didn't know what Bible preaching was but I sat there in that jail cell and for the first time in my life I felt something on the inside tugging at me saying son when are you going to get tired of the way you're living and I sat there looking around saying God I know I need to get in church it was a Saturday night I sat there on a Saturday night and I'll never forget I got the next morning morning. I said, praise God, I'm getting out of here. And they come in and said, sir, I just want you to know the magistrate's in church today. The magistrate's in church today and she's not going to be out till this afternoon, so you're going to stay here. And I was sitting there, preacher, thinking for the first time in my life, I wish I was in church. Sure wish. Man, I sure rather be in church than where I'm at tonight. And the God of heaven began to stir up something inside of me. I hadn't been married but about six months. My marriage was about to fall apart. Sin was destroying us. And I'm telling you something, me and my wife both knew that we needed help. And we knew, listen, we didn't know anything about the Bible, but we knew there was a God in heaven that could help us. We started going to church. I remember, brother, I remember going to church. We visited a few different churches and I finally stumbled into a church where a leather-lunged Bible-believing preacher got up in the pulpit and preached against everything I was doing. Man, I'm serious. I honestly, I thought he'd been spying on me. I didn't know anything about church. I thought he'd been spying on me. He's been following me around. 
I thought, man alive, he knows everything I'm doing. But brother, listen to me, sir. Listen to me. I told my wife, we left there that day. I said, I'm never going back to that church again. We went home. I didn't have any intentions of going to that church again. And by the, later that week, a red and gray Ford F-150 come pulling in my driveway. For the first time in my life, a preacher came to my house, knocked on my door. I remember I was hiding beer cans, shoving stuff up under the couch, hiding stuff, thinking, what in the world is this preacher doing at my house? And he came to my house. And I remember, he, listen, he wasn't coming in to beat me over the head. He didn't come in pointing out everything I was doing. That man came in and loved me, Brother Craig. He loved me and told me how much he appreciated me and my wife coming to church, sat down in my living room and treated me like a friend. And invited me back to church and I said, I'll come back to church. I went back that Sunday, felt the same way again. I said, man, he brought me back in here to preach to me the same way. I ain't going back to this place. He came back again the next week, taught me into coming again and I came again. And I finally told my wife, I said, I'm gonna tell you something. I done figured this thing out. As long as every time we miss, he comes to our house. As long as we keep going to church, he won't come see us no more. We started going to church every service. We were more faithful than the deacons. I mean, me and my wife are lost. We were going Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meeting, ladies meeting, I was there, it didn't matter. Whatever was going on, I wanted to be at church. God was a real me. And I didn't understand it all then like I understand it now. But God looked down from heaven and saw an Egyptian in the field. I was a slave to my flesh, a slave to sin. And God sent a man. Thank God he saw an Egyptian in the field and he gave me bread to eat. Amen. Now listen, I was left for dead, but thank God for a preacher that fed me, gave me the word of God, gave me the hay water. Amen of God's word, the bread of God's word. There's a field that must be reached. There's a family that must be rescued, sir. In verse 18 and 19, David went out and he recovered all. Had David laid down and rolled over and played dead, his family would have died captive. Sir, the only hope your family's got is for you to man up. The only hope, listen to me, the only hope America's got is not in the White House like the preacher said earlier. The only hope for America's got, the only hope America's got is not gonna be found in the White House and it may not even be found at the church house until it's first found at your house. Listen to me, men, the church house will never be what it needs to be until your house is what it needs to be. God give us a generation of men when Jesus got ready to start his church. He didn't raise up women to start it with. He didn't raise up children to start it with. Thank God for women and children. But Jesus said, I want 12 men that I can turn this world upside down with and he still looking for some men today to make a difference in this country for Jesus Christ. The hope for America, sir, is not who wins the next election. The hope is you getting saved and living for God. The hope for America, sir, amen, is not whether Republicans get in office next term. The hope for, amen, the hope for America is for you to repent of your sin and say, by the grace of God, I want to live for the Lord with all my heart. That's the hope for America. Right here, if Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 men, what could the men in this room do if we'd all get right with God? What could your family do for God, sir, if you'd lead the way? Your wife can't follow a parked car. She needs you to be a leader, sir. Your children can't follow a parked car. She needs you to be a leader. Listen, I love you men. I'm not, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I love you guys. You know why I'm saved tonight preaching the gospel? I had a preacher tell me like I'm telling you tonight. This is the answer. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the hope of America. Jesus is the hope of your marriage. Jesus is the hope of your home. Jesus is the answer. Amen. There's a family that must be rescued. There's a foe that must be reengaged. Amen. David went out, reengaged against the enemy. Amen. He didn't say, well, you know, my own army's turning against me. I might as well quit. Ain't nobody in the church wanting to serve God these days. There's not many men wanting to serve God these days. I think I'm just gonna quit and sit down on God. No, that's not what he did. David played the man. He pursued when others were pouting. He conquered when others quit. He manned up when others murmured and complained. Brother, he played the man. What are we looking for tonight? I'll tell you what God's looking for. 
Regardless of what America's looking for, I'm going to tell you what God's looking for. God's looking for some teenagers that'll man up. God's looking for some of you young men to get a fire burn your bones and man up for God and say, I don't care what all the other young people are doing. I don't care what the other teenagers are doing. I don't care what they're pursuing. I don't care what they're talking about and how much they're enjoying their play parties and they're seeing out there in the world. I know for me, I want to make a difference when my life is over. I want to know my life counted for God. God, give us a generation of young men, not sissies, not let me tell you something, young man. Living for God's not for sissies. If you're going to be a sissy, you might as well sit down. God's looking for some men that'll man up and play the man. Guys, listen to me. Listen to me. Anybody can live for the world. Sissies can do that. But it's going to take some men to live for God. You can be what they are any day, but there's not many of them that can be what you are. Are you listening to me? God needs some men tonight, some daddies, some grandpas, some teenage boys who will say, by the grace of God, I'm not going to wait on the preacher to pump me up, prime me up. Get, help me get victory. I'm not going to wait on the church to help me. I'm not going to wait on mom and daddy to help me. I'm going to man up and play the man. David encouraged himself in the Lord. There is a, I'm going to tell you something. My grandpa and my daddy used to drag me coon hunting. I was a little boy. We went every night, drug us through the woods. I know what it is, walk through the swamps when it's cold, amen, wading through the water. I know what it is to lose coon dogs, coons crawl up on their head. And, Hey, brother, I remember all those days. I remember sleeping in the pickup truck in the middle of the night. Honestly, I remember many, a day, many, many a nights, many days, we'd go hunting through the night. My daddy, we'd look for the dogs half the night. My daddy come home. I remember through the summer, my daddy coming home, and I don't remember if it's summer or winter, but I remember him coming home, taking a shower, going straight to work. Hey, Amen. I mean, brother, we did. But I remember my grandpa telling me this preacher. He said, boys, we'd get down in the woods somewhere and the dogs would be barking. He said, boys, we, we start going down there to where they was at. He'd see the dogs down there, and he said, all right, son, we can go to the tree now. All the dogs are looking up. That let us know, Brother Peter, <laughs> they had something tree. He said, we can, go to the, we can go to the tree now. All the dogs are looking up. I'm going to tell you something, men. We can go to the tree now because we're all looking up. Let me tell you something, sir. Let me tell you why we're here tonight. We're here tonight because God reached down in a field somewhere one day and picked us up. And this world had rejected us. The Amalekites had left us to die. There was the grace of God that sent a man named David out in the middle of a field, picked us up. Amen. Gave us something to eat. Fed us when we were so weak we couldn't stand on our own two feet. Fed us the word of God. Poured the water into our lives. Amen. Thank God for the greater David. Thank God Jesus Christ picked us up. Gave us water that we'd never thirst again. Gave us the bread of life. You know why, ladies and gentlemen? You know why, gentlemen, he did that? Because, brother, he loves you so much. He cares for you so much that he'd rather die than for you to go to hell. The Son of God came and one day on a school shaped hill, the Son of God became the Son, of, listen to me, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become sons of God. We are here tonight because God died on a tree. The Son of God died on Calvary's cross. He took your sin debt. We should have died. There's nothing good in us. We should have died. Every one of us should have died, but Jesus came and died in your place, sir, so you could go free. There's no way we could man up tonight and play the man had it not been for the man Christ Jesus, the God man. And tonight, sir, I want to ask you one question. Are you willing to play the man? It's not your wife's responsibility to play the man. It's not your children's responsibility to play the man. Will you? David encouraged himself in the Lord. Preacher, I'm done preaching. Let's bow our heads for a moment, please. Caden, if you'll come up and play for us something, please. Before Caden starts playing, I'm going to ask you a question tonight. In order to be the man God wants you to be, you've got to be God's man. 
Do you know you're saved, fellas? Nobody's looking. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know if you die tonight, you go to heaven? He said, boy, you got me in here to preach to me. I got you here because I love you. I want to see you saved. If you're here tonight, say, preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I need you to pray for me. I'm not sure if I die tonight, I'd go to heaven. Pray for me, pastor. Nobody's looking, won't come to you, won't embarrass you, but I'll pray for you. This preacher pray for you. Would you lift your hand? Say, I need your prayers. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Or maybe you're here tonight and you say, you know what? I know I'm, I know I'm not saved. I'm sure I'm not saved. Pray for me. Anyone like that? Would you be concerned and honest enough to say, Pastor, pray for me? Pray for me. I need your prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anyone like that tonight? Maybe you're here tonight and say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but I'm certainly not the man God wants me to be. Pray for me. There's some areas in my life that need attention. Pray for me, Pastor. Would you slip your hand up all over the building? There's some areas in my life that need attention. Pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. Caden's going to play, and let's stand together. He's going to play just for a moment. And as he plays, I want you to come tonight. Maybe you just need to gather around the altar and say, you know what? God, help me to man up. Help me to be what you've intended for me to be. Maybe you need to start leading your family in devotions. Maybe you start needing praying with your wife. Some of you need to be more faithful to church. Whatever the need, won't you come tonight? Some of you need to be witnessing for him. Why don't you come? and said, I'll do that. I'm going to man up. I'm going to be the man God wants me to be. Would you come as Caden plays? Let's gather around the altar tonight and pray. Just for a moment, would you come? Would you come while he's playing? Would you come? They just want to come pray for your family, pray for your home. How many of you would say tonight, nobody's looking, Pastor, my, my marriage is in trouble and I need your prayers. My home or my marriage is in trouble. Nobody's looking but me. I need your prayer. My home, my marriage is in trouble. I need your prayer. Would you slip your hand up and let me pray for you? Nobody's looking. We can be honest tonight. I want to pray for you. Anyone like that? My home needs help, Pastor. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Maybe you're a young person here and you say, my mom or dad's not saved. I need you to pray with me about them. Mom or dad's not saved. Just slip your hand up. Let me pray with you about it. While he plays, would you come? What a message. Father, thank you for this night. God, thank you for these men that have come. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Brother Watson. I pray that you're blessed now the remainder of the night. God, I pray that you'll help us to be in your house tomorrow and be uh, participators, Lord, in your worship. And God, I pray that you'd save some soul tomorrow uh, during the 11 o'clock hour. And God, I just pray that you'll be with us tonight. Keep us safe. Thank you for these men. Pray you'll take them back to their respective places. Uh, Lord, healthy and safe. Well, thank you. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Those you may look this way. My, what a message. Amen. Brother Watson, thank you so much. What a message. What a message. What a message. And I know you guys, some of you's got plans afterwards, and you may have been, I'm going to tell you, I could have listened to that all night and uh, because it brings home what we need to be 
And uh, why, you know, why are there so many bossy women, Pastor? Let me tell you why there's so many bossy women that are out of place. Let me tell you why. Because men sitting in the recliner drinking tea while mama runs the house. Oh, mama, go get them. Honey, go get them to be quiet. You go get them to be quiet. Tell mama to do it. Go to the door, mama. You go to the door. It sent the lady to the door. We just need to be men. God wants us to be. And that's what your wife deserves, sir. Amen. I know one, one old preacher used to say, he said, I'm praying for some of you men to die so your wife will have a real man. <laughs> he sure did. He said, he said the only way, only way she's going to get a real man is if you pass away. <laughs> oh, I sure did. I don't believe I'd say that, but I, I sure took it to heart. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here tonight. I love you. Brother Watson, thank you, man. Fellas, Caden, the boys back, thank you, thank you, thank you for singing. Our fellows from Freedom, thank you. Wonderful night, and we'll do this again next year. Hope you can make it. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Be sure to go by and get some desserts and things that, that uh, you need to get. I'm sure they're still there, a lot left. And be sure to go by and get that. Take them home with you because we don't want to throw it out. Brother Jim Wilson, would you?